Hey everybody, it's your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete, and this is my series, Nails in the Coffin, where we learned that with great kills, they must also come. Great nails. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel. If you are new here, you can read what Nails in the Coffin is all about in the section down below. I really appreciate it. Now, these videos, they're not film reviews. There are tons of those on the internet. This is rather a breakdown of the kills, and I evaluate how well the victim responded to their attack. So, I'm continuing my adventure in some Giotto films. So, so far I've covered A Blade in the Dark, Deep Red, and A Bay of Blood. I loved all three of those movies so much. This week, I'm covering another Giotto from genre legend, Dario Argento. This film was his actual de de directorial sorry, <laughs> debut. I'm nailing 1970s The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. This story follows an American writer in Rome who becomes a witness to an attempted murder and he finds himself entangled in this like web of intrigue as he tries to solve this mystery. This is a very important film in the Giallo genre, uh, subgenre. Um, a lot of themes take place in this film that become staples in Giallo films that come after it, such as a dark trench coat, black leather gloves... And this film is also the first installment of Dario Gento's Animal Trilogy, followed by 1971's Cat and Nine Tales and 1971's Four Flies on Grey Velvet, which I'm sure to cover on Nails in a Coffin in the future. So, let us find out how well his victims respond with my Nails in a Coffin in this Lamont Giallo. Our first on-screen kills happens about 30 minutes into the film. Rosita is home at night getting ready for bed. She's undressing and we see the killer fiddling with some keys. Rosita gets in bed for a good night's rest and she turns off the light as she's enjoying her evening cigarette. The door to the bedroom is open and Rosita leans over to extinguish her cigarette. When she looks back to the door, we see a man in a dark trench coat standing there and she screams. We then see the killer on top of her, one hand over her mouth, and a hold, holding a very large knife. And I do love the look of fear in her eyes at this part. But the killer removes her clothes and then stabs her in the groin with the knife killing her. Rosita gets our first set of nails in his early giallo, and she hurt herself one nail in the coffin. Another case of not fighting for your life. The killer had one hand over her mouth and the other holding the blade. He doesn't. He does get up off of her, and her arms are free. She just never used her arms or tried to scream again. I mean, this is life and death. I mean, you don't have to make it that easy for the killer to achieve their goal. Fight, scream, claw, punch, run away. Do something other than just laying there frozen in fear. I know that can happen to some people, but you can't freeze in times like this. You know, especially if, if the person gets off of you after being on top of you. Even if you know they're going to kill you 100%. You just can't let him do it that easy without trying anything. And she really didn't do anything at all, so I can only give her one nail in the coffin. Sam, he's the American writer who witnesses the attack at the beginning of the film. He's on an evening stroll with his girlfriend, Julia. He has to stay in Rome since he was the only witness to this person's attack. He's trying to help the police find the identity of the killer. There's a bodyguard following them since the local police, Sam, could be in danger since he's the witness. Sam tries to hail a cab, but he's ignored. Then a car pulls up behind the bodyguard with the headlights off. They turn on. The car accelerates towards the bodyguard. He can't get away in time, and he's ran over and killed. This unnamed bodyguard is awarded one and a half now in a coffin. He wasn't a very good bodyguard. You know, from the time he was on screen, he never checked behind him. As a bodyguard, I think you're going to be looking for potential threats. This guy did none of that. He also made it very obvious he was watching the couple. He wasn't good at his job. And when he was trying to run from the car, he kept going right where there was a wall from the buildings. Even less room for him to go. I think he made a lot of poor decisions here. Even if he was dead no matter what, he could have ran to the left, tried, you know, getting on the hood, do something other than running into the wall that was closest to you, pretty much just cornering yourself. So I didn't see enough from this guy to give him any more than one and a half nails in the coffin. Alberto, the husband of the woman who was attacked at the start of the film, was the one driving the car. After killing the bodyguard, he gets out of the car, places a silencer on his pistol, and chases Sam and Julia. Sam tells Julia to hide in an alley and go get help as he draws Alberto away from her. Alberto's chase eventually takes them to a bus depot where it's a cat and mouse game between he and Sam. Sam was able to find his way out onto the main street, and then he comes upon three men and tells, hey, there's a man chasing him with the gun. They look, see Alberto, who's now hidden in the weapon, and he's walking away, ending the pursuit. And Sam decides to follow this man to find out what the heck he's doing. Alberto must have planned this well, because he was wearing a bright yellow jacket with blue lettering on the back. You'd think it'd be really easy to follow him. So Sam follows 
uh, Alberto to a hotel, staying out of sight the entire time. Once in the hotel, Sam asks a bellhop if anybody's seen a man wearing a yellow jacket. I guess he did see somebody point Sam in that direction. Sam opens doors and sees a man in a yellow jacket. And he opens the doors further and sees dozens of men wearing the same yellow jacket with blue lettering on the back that Alberto was wearing. Whether it was convenience or planned out, I kind of like how this part played out. On to the killer's next victim. Tina was just dropped off by her date. And it was nice to see the boyfriend waiting for her to get in the building before he left. Just something I noticed. Like, nice touch. She presses the button for the elevator, but it doesn't come. And then she looks up to the long walk she's going to have to get to her floor. Tina starts her long walk up to her apartment, and she, as she's ascending the stairs, the lights go out on the floors above her. She can't see anything, so she takes a moment and strikes a match to give herself some light. And she continues to walk upstairs. Right as she gets to her door, she's struck from behind as she falls to the floor right inside her apartment hallway. The killer takes out a straight razor as Tina is cowering on the floor, and she's then killed after being repeatedly slashed with the blade. Tina earned herself two nails in a coffin. She did show some smarts when the lights went out by lighting a match to give herself some illumination. Unfortunately, in the dark, she was struck from behind and knocked down. Before she could really defend herself, she was slashed at numerous times. At least she covered up with her arms to defend herself from the attack. And, you know, she was screaming. I didn't see her make any brash, stupid decisions here. She was pretty much in the wrong place at the wrong time and... Yeah, she tried to defend herself the best she could after being knocked nearly unconscious. So she did more than the average victim. So I'm going to give her two nails in the coffin. Only one more death in this early giallo. Sam and Professor Dover's investigation lead them to finding out that the killer is, in fact, Alberto. Thanks to the sounds of a bird that was heard on one of the phone calls made by the killer. And this is where the bird with the crystal plumage in the title comes from. While checking out this bird, the only one in Italy at a zoo, they see an open window and they hear a scream. So Sam and the police take off running. They break down the door and they see an altercation between Alberto and Monica fighting over a knife. The cops have their guns drawn on Alberto, giving Monica a chance to get to safety. And she rushes over to Sam for some support. Alberto, he won't drop the knife or give himself up. The cops are getting closer to him and he stabs one of them in the stomach. But it's not a life-threatening wound. The other cop tackles Alberto in order to subdue him. And Monica then runs out of the room while Sam and the police officer are trying to fight with Alberto. During the scuffle, Alberto falls out of this large open window. Sam and the officer are trying to get him back inside, but Alberto is hanging on by one arm. He's saying, help me, I don't want to die. But Sam is trying to pull him back up, but he loses his grip and Alberto falls to his death. Our final set of nails go to Alberto and... He's only going to get one of them. One nail in the coffin. He was trying to fight the cops right by a big ass open window. He wasn't going to get away from the cops. He was cornering. So not surrendering, I think, was pretty stupid. Also, after he fell out of the window, he was only hanging on by one arm. I don't know why he didn't use his other arm to help pull himself back up with the help of Sam. It's not like in Die Hard when Hans had a gun in the other hand, he tried to shoot John. But there's no reason why I didn't say he didn't use both arms. And before he fell, he said, I don't want to die. So it, why fight the cops? Why not surrender? Why not use another arm? I just saw too many mistakes leading to his death, which is, at best, he's only going to get that one nail in the coffin. Following Alberto's demise, Sam becomes aware that Julia's missing, and he goes looking for X and some people if they've seen her, and they point him in the direction. He finds himself in this apartment building, and he's going up the stairs, and when he does, the lights go out, so he enters this dimly lit apartment that he was next to, and while he's inside the apartment, he knocks over a phone. And when it falls, you see Julia bound and gagged under a couch. Sam trips and falls to the floor. When he looks up, he sees Carlos sitting in a chair with a knife. Thinking it's the killer, Sam goes for him. However, Carlos dead. And he was just propped up in the chair since he's got a good old stab wound in the back of the neck. Sam gets to his feet. And when he does, he hears laughter and sees somebody standing in front of him, cloaked in darkness. The shocking twist occurs when... Sam finds a gleeful Monica in the black raincoat, and it dawns on him that the incident he witnessed at the gallery was actually not an attack on Monica, but rather her attempt to murder Alberto. Monica flees, and Sam gives chase, uh, arriving at an art gallery. There, Monica traps him beneath his heavy spiked sculpture. Wielding a knife, she's taunting him while laughing menacingly, but before she can fatally stab him, she's knocked down with a judo chop. It's the police. They arrived just in time to apprehend Monica, saving Sam's life. There we go, ladies and gentlemen, those are all my nails in a coffin for the bird with the crystal plumage. Here's a summary of all the nails I've awarded. 
The average nails in a coffin for this movie is 1.38 nails, which is on the lower end for most of the films I've covered. And I think what actually hurt this average is there were only four on-screen deaths that I was able to evaluate. Here's the average nails in a coffin for the all Giallo movies I've covered so far this year. A Blade in the Dark, 1.5 nails. Deep Red, slightly higher, 1.58 nails. A Bay of Blood leading the pack right now with the highest average so far with 1.92 nails in the coffin. And we just dropped out the bird with the crystal plumage with 1.38 nails. I like this movie a lot. It was a lot of fun to cover. Our first viewing, I was a little puzzled on how they revealed the identity of the killer so early on. But then you get hit with the twist, and I think that was an excellent payoff at the end. Small thing I noticed is I love the use of lighting in this film. When Tina was killed, the lights go out. When Sam was in the apartment building, the lights go out. So then he goes and saw this dimly lit apartment, and the use of shadows sets the scene really well. At the end, when he's following Monica, the lights turn on and then he's trapped. It's one of those subtle touches that really sells the atmosphere you're going for. And that's one of the things that Dario Argento is, does so very, very well. And watching this film, you can see how other films to come after it were so influenced by the style of this film. But there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. All that usual stuff. I really would appreciate it. And I'll see you here next week when I continue nailing some more Giallo. Not sure what film that's going to be yet, but it's going to be a good one. I promise. So take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Stay safe and be good to each other. I am your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete. And remember, with great kills, there must also come great nails.